Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It is a blessing and privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter another new week that wasn't promised that this message finds you blessed. It finds you um, challenged and also impacting the world for the kingdom's sake. Amen. And so I got a question for you. When would you say when the gospel entered the world that it changed it? Yes. So that's an amen, right? Amen. That when the gospel came, the world changed. And so when we think about the world changing because of the gospel, do we often always think about the ones that calls out in the Bible that talks about it, that brought it forth when it speaks of the James and the Johns and the Matthews and the Marks and the Lukes and the Peters and the Pauls and all this good kind of stuff? Because that's normally where we find pieces of the gospel captured is where they're speaking it or they're preaching it or they're teaching it and things of that nature. So oftentimes we feel like that's the only way in which the gospel moved forward. But I'm reminded of that there's so much more to that, because if you look over in Acts chapter one, you will verse eight, it says this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. And so he's speaking to the apostles when he says that everyone is pretty much familiar with Matthew 28 verses 18 and 19, which is the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. so once again, he's speaking to the apostles. And so oftentimes we feel like it's only the apostles who has the the calling to really do that when it's all of us. Right. But you see, here's the thing. When this was spoken Jesus had just told them to stay in Jerusalem until the power comes, right? But here was the issue. When you go six chapters in, when you get to chapter seven, they ain't moved yet. They ain't wiggled, giggled, or done nothing. And so what you find is that Pete, Paul, um, Stephen, who was preaching the word to the people, Chapter seven toward the end of it is when Stephen, you find Stephen gives a beautiful message, beautiful, takes him from Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament. Beautiful message. And you find that they got so angry with him that they chased him out of the city and they stoned him for speaking the gospel truth to him. And Saul, who later becomes Paul, was present when all of this happened. Amen. Amen. And so here is the thing. In the process of stoning Stephen, he says these words as he looks up and see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he says, Father, forgive them. No, he says, Father, do not hold this sin against them. They're killing him. And he's asking God not to hold the sin against them. So here is the thing. He wasn't an apostle. He was just a you or a me. Y'all get this? Mm -hmm. But you see, when you go over to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. And Saul approved of of their killing him. Mm -hmm. And it says, and on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea in Samaria. Now, here's the thing. This is after the stoning of Stephen. Persecution of the church comes and everyone scatters to out to Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Mm -hmm. Verse four says this. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Amen. Did they give a name? Mm -hmm. It says those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went because see the apostles were still back in. Jerusalem. Amen. And so verse four says in those who were scattered and it says early in verse one, they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And what were they doing? They were preaching the word. So this is the gospel spreading to Judea and Samaria. Now, you got to realize God, Jesus spoke these words originally to the apostles. Right. But when you find somebody who was other than the apostles now being the ones carrying it out. Now, what's interesting is this. 
It was just ordinary, average believers who were spreading the gospel into new places. It's us, y'all. The world is changing just by everyday, ordinary people carrying the word of God with them wherever they were going. And they were fleeing persecution, but they were carrying hope with them. My God. So when you see the word preaching here, don't just think, okay, it's the gifted preachers who were making the word known all over the world. It was just the everyday believers who knew the gospel, who were proclaiming the gospel. God uses ordinary believers to spread the word. Somebody need to say something. See, because see, we can count all the named people on our hands and fingers and toes, right? But you don't have enough body parts to count all the no-name people who took the message forward. The world changed because of the gospel. Everywhere it goes, God says, my word will not go forward and come back void. But if you don't carry it with you, it don't have a chance to impact the world. You see, the gospel went out. To the nations, to Judea and Samaria, through ordinary, everyday believers who had the gospel in them and the spirit of God in them. And they were witnesses everywhere they went and they were preaching the word just like it should be from us today. Amen. Amen. So now if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew chapter nine. Starting at the ninth verse, say amen when you have it, if not, so wait on me. Amen. Now, I want you to realize, here's what I love about this. First of all, Matthew is going to talk about himself. You never really think about that when you read the Matthew and the tax collector booth experience. This is Matthew writing about himself, his conversion. We like the story of it, but he is telling the unadulterated God, he knows what he went through when he... When Jesus walked past him, that's what's blessing me. Because prior to that, he was one of the most hated men on the planet when it came to the Jews. But listen to what he says. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Verse 10. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply to say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hours come where your people have got themselves together. Once again, to hear from on high. So Master, as your servant stands this morning, I pray for preaching power. That you fill me afresh in you with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer and will be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. This morning's sermon title is called A World Changer. A World Changer. At the top of your outline, you will find the words investing in a life. It says investing in a life is walking into the path of someone as you go through life. And as often as that person encounters you, they see something of God in your life that creates a thirst or a hunger in them to want what you have in Christ. Amen. Amen. The greatest sermon ever preached <coughs> is the one that is lived out. The greatest sermon ever preached is the one that is lived out because it touches lives. And they just don't hear it. They see it and they experience it. And so I just want to welcome you once again this morning. When we walk in unconditional love, we see life around us through a different set of eyes. Somebody needs to say something. We see life through the eyes of our heart and not just our head. 
Do y'all realize that unconditional love is the key to changing the world? Somebody should say something. And so, but the next step from unconditional love is this. It is to invest in a life. If you have unconditional love and you are on an island by yourself, it does you no good. Amen? Amen. So when you walk in this unconditional love because it is the epitome of who you are and you invest in another life that don't believe like you believe. That love has the ability to make a change, doesn't it? And so Jesus models this for us throughout the New Testament. Look with me at verse 9a as we see what he, it means to invest in a life. It says, as he went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me. Now, here's the part that blessed me. Don't. Fool yourself thinking that Jesus doesn't know who Matthew is sitting in the booth. He knows what he's doing. He knows what job he possesses. And he knows how the Jews feel about him because he's doing this. And yet Jesus walks past him and he simply says these words. Follow me. See, I'm talking about changing the world. Here's the thing. What is so beautiful about this passage of scripture is Jesus once again shows us that he has no respective person. Mm-hmm. Do y'all get that? Anybody. Amen. He chose someone that was a known sinner, the epitome of people who normally would walk past him and wouldn't even put eyesight on them. Jesus walks into the pathway of a tax collector named Matthew and tells him to follow him. Tax collectors were hated and despised by the Jews. They looked down on them to the point that Matthew chapter 5 verse 46 says this. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do that? They were looked down upon them, right? The Jews hated them because of their crookedness and because of their oppressive taxes. And most of all, because they served the interest of of Roman Empire. Somebody needs to say something. See, I'm talking about being a world changer this morning. And it's in verse 9b that we see Matthew's response to Jesus's follow me. It says, and Matthew got up and followed him. Do y'all get that? Matthew got up and followed him. Jesus passes by the tax office. He says to Matthew, follow me. His response was instantaneous. He didn't look for nobody to take over the ticket booth. He didn't go, I'll be with you in a half hour. My lunch break will be then. He didn't do any of that. Jesus walks by, says, follow me. And Matthew instantaneously, if not sooner, gets up and walks with him. He rose and followed him. Can you imagine what he had to have seen in Jesus's life? Knowing that the Jews had no dealings with him. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes by and says, follow me. First of all, he didn't, you notice that he didn't chastise him for being a tax collector. He didn't chastise him for being crooked. He didn't chastise him for for deceiving and, and robbing people. He didn't chastise him for working for Rome. He just walked past him and said, follow me, right? Oh, my. Do you know the first step toward coming to know the Lord is obedience? See, we don't know if he had faith yet. But we know he had obedience. How do we know that? Because he followed. Oh, my. So he heard the word of the Lord. And responded. Come on now. I just want to break it down so you can see, because I'm talking about being a world changer right now. Because see, this is how Matthew became a world changer. He heard the word and he followed. He answered the word and followed in obedience. Wow. The Apostle Paul was another one that called people to follow him. His life reflected godliness and Christ likeness. We know a lot of people, Mm y'all. How many of us can we walk past them and say, follow me? Huh? You see what I'm saying? If there's not an emphatic yes in your life right now, there's a problem. 
Many of us have been walking with the Lord for more than a couple of days. Amen. And we should be able to walk past people and say, follow me. Huh? See, it looks on y'all faces. See, that's the issue. Because the thing is this. You are now the Johns and the Pauls and the Peters. You are. You're also the no name. This is how the gospel is going to go forward. This is how the world is going to change. It's going to change through us. We are world changers. We are the ambassador of the one who sent us. My God. You see. Paul shares this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. He says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Verse 16, I urge you then be imitators of me. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. Be imitators of me. So he's telling them to follow me, walk like me, talk like me, live like me. But we'll say, well, he was Paul, though. Right. You are called to be a world changer. You carry the good news, the gospel. Amen. Amen. And so but let's look at Matthew's change of life benefits real quick. He left a job that was traditionally dishonest. Amen? Amen. To become a disciple of Jesus. So he went from being bad to being good. From evil to great. Right? Evil to holy. However which way you want to. But I want you to get it. This is some of the benefits he got right off the bat. He also became part of the inner 12. Mm -hmm. Amen. Just by decision. And then... He was honored to write the gospel which bears his name. Are y'all seeing that? But most importantly, his name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. All because he heeded the word when it came by. Mm -hmm. The word said, follow me. Are y'all getting this? You see, it's in verse 10a that we see Jesus building a relationship. Listen to what he says. And while he while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. So Matthew threw a great dinner banquet for Jesus. And this was Matthew's way of confessing Christ publicly and introducing his friends to his savior. So now you know that this is a full conversion that's taking place because see, he didn't accept Jesus in the corner or in the dark closet someplace. He accepted him publicly because I'm talking about being a world changer. He went from being one of the most hated to one of the most blessed. Wow. Luke chapter 5 verse 29 says, And Levi, which is his original name, made him a great feast in his own house. A great feast. And there were a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. For Matthew was telling the world, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Somebody needs to say something. So, and when we walk in unashamed of our redemption through Christ, we cast the light that the whole world can see. People know when your room changes when you walk in because not because you and your flesh came in, but because God in your heart showed up. Oh, I have been tremendously blessed walking with people who don't believe, who have no problem telling me I'm atheist or I'm this or I'm that. Oh, tremendously blessed. Because here's the deal. I'm in the harvest field. But you can't harvest if you ain't planting. Ooh. I've never seen nobody go pick up something out the field that they didn't put in there. Ooh. But you see, here's the thing. I'm talking about being a world changer. 
It's in verse 10b. We also see the background of Matthew's other guests. It says, and many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. You see, those looking in from the outside had plenty to say about the guest list. Everybody will have something to say when they see you doing the will of God, especially go, well, he's supposed to be a Christian. He's over there with all them sinning folks. Well, here's the deal. We're called to go out into the world, but not to become the world. Whoo. Matthew had invited to break bread with Jesus, tax collectors, and those who were known to be sinners in the community. Known. And when it speaks of sinners, that category was broad. Everything under the sun was represented. And they were not running from Jesus. They came to him and broke bread with them. The best way to learn to know somebody is sit down and have a meal with them. And they did not fear Jesus. And they did not try to have, they didn't have the time or the opportunity to cover up who they were. Neither did Matthew in the tax collector's booth. We've always heard the scripture say, just come as you are, right? Matthew couldn't hide from being in the booth. He couldn't shrink low enough for Jesus not to see him. So he came just as he was, sinful, broken. My God. You see, and they all ate with Jesus and his disciples. Y'all understand, he sat down and he broke bread with sinners. Okay? His disciples too. He's teaching. He's teaching. Because see, when Jesus is gone, his disciples have to carry on. Right? So what is before them is what writes on them as to what they shall become. Which also dictates what they shall do. So you understand that, right? He's teaching. It's in verse 11a that we see people are always watching, will always have something to say. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples. Now, you got to realize this, right? They asked the disciples, they didn't ask Jesus. They didn't go to the horse's mouth. They went to the man standing next to the man, they stand next to the man, they stand next to the man. Now, you must remember it was the Pharisees that led the charge to try Jesus and for him to be hung on the cross. The Pharisees were considered to be the religious. Amen. The religious. They were saying in essence that they represent who God is. But yet they're asking these questions. And, for, and so for them to see him eating with what was called a social riffraff, you could almost hear them say to Jesus' disciples, no true prophet would ever eat with sinners. But somehow they forgot these simple words that Paul captures in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all in every language. Greek, Aramaic, <laughs> Hebrew, all that all means is all. And so the Pharisees saw themselves as heavenly minded. But in reality, they were no earthly good. Somebody need to say something. Amen. See, I'm talking about being a world changer this morning, but it's in verse 11b. We see the Pharisees charge. It says, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And so three things should be noted in the charges against Jesus. First one, the charges were true. Jesus did eat with sinners. Amen. Secondly, it is important to remember that when he ate with sinners, he never indulged in their evil ways or compromised his testimony. Somebody to say something. Amen. He didn't water it down. He didn't just say a little sin should be okay. Fourth, he used the occasion to call them to truth and holiness. Now, they're either they're going to accept it or not, but he doesn't destroy anyone. He doesn't kick over the tables, slap the wine out their hand, take the food out their mouth. Oh, you can't. Because can you imagine being there with Jesus and all of a sudden Matthew's got this beautiful spread out before him. And before he lets them eat, he goes, wait a minute. Father, thank you for the food that we're about to receive, maybe for the nourishment of our bodies. I ask these in your name, God. 
Amen. Can you imagine how everybody felt? Looked around the room for a moment. Right? And to see Matthew, eyes closed, hands up like this, and they're going, Matthew ain't never done that. Because see, Jesus always gave thanks. So don't fool, don't fool yourself that when this banquet was put forth, his character changed. He blessed the meal. Thank God for those who came to break bread. Isn't that powerful? They didn't have to believe. Do you know when I sat down with people and we're out together eating, whether I'm in my home or out at the restaurant, I will ask, is it okay if I say blessing? They usually let me say it, even though they don't believe. But you see, I don't change, and I'm not trying to force it on you, but I'm trying to help them understand. I'm loving you even though I know where you stand, and you're loving me because you know where I stand as well. I respect you enough to ask, and I'm not just going to force it on you. But I don't stop being me because you're you. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about being a world changer. And that's how it happens. You see, you will be amazed to know that those kind of folks, when you do those kind of things, and it's coming from a genuine place in your heart, that you will start to get some calls saying, I got so-and-so going in my life, and I, I know that uh, God sees the, seems to listen to you, so if you could put a prayer on this for me. Now, I don't believe like that, but I know you do. Those are real words spoken to me. I don't believe like that, but I know you do, and he seems to listen to you. So they see something, right? Amen. See, that's what I'm talking about. I'm planting seeds, baby. I'm planting seeds and watering. I'm Johnny Appleseed up in this, okay? And I'm running along watering because at some point, I might get the harvest. And if I don't get the harvest, you might get the harvest. But you see, you can't harvest if there's no seed planted. Amen. Ooh. And so how do you help get the soil ready for the seed? Walk with them. Mm -hmm. Help them start to unpack some of the stuff in their life. To understand that it's not you just didn't make a bad decision. It's a sinful situation. Ooh. Don't stone me, y'all. Let me live. <laughs> but I love this because he. The charges were true. He used it as occasion to call them to truth and holiness. For I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul shared in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23. He says these beautiful words. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, 21, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Verse 23, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. Somebody needs to say something. See, I'm talking about being a world changer. He became all things to all men that he might win some for the Lord. Ooh. In becoming all things to every man doesn't mean we become like them in nature or action. Somebody needs to say something, but we meet them where they are. Jesus met them where they were at. And here was the thing that got the vacation the day at the banquet with Jesus. Judgment. There will be a time and a place for that. My job is to love on you, to show you God's love, to call you to holiness, but not just call it in word, but to do it in life. What you see in me. That's the thing. I often tell you a mouth will say anything, but a life reveals the truth. And so here's the thing. 
Verse 12a, we see Jesus' response to the Pharisees. He says, on hearing this, Jesus said, now hold up, I got to stop. <laughs> they ask the question to the disciple and Jesus answers. Y'all get that, right? They ask the question to his disciples and it says here in verse 12a, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor. They asked the question, so they, they, they tried to, right? And Jesus answered. They went to the disciples. They went to the man to stand next to the man to stand next to the man to ask the question. And Jesus answers. The healthy, Jesus was pointing out to the Pharisees, the religious, y'all. They considered themselves healthy and were unwilling to confess their need for Jesus. But in, the, in actuality, they were extremely ill spiritually and dis desperately in need of a healing. Somebody say something. They couldn't discern what Jesus was doing for the Apostle Paul shares in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, these words. The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. My God. This is the natural man, the man without God. So when you start talking spiritual things with a carnal minded person, they don't get it. The eyes glaze over. They start thinking about golf swings in their head and all sorts of stuff. It's in verse 12b that Jesus reveals who he came to see. He says, but the sick, I came to see the sick. The tax collectors and sinners didn't hide their fallen state. They showed up just as they were. Come as you are. Most times, well, when I get myself together, I'm going to come to church. You're never going to make it, except when they roll you in the box. You'll come to church then, but it's too late. End game. He just says, come as you are. But here's the other piece you got to realize. It is never on the unsaved person's heart to come by the church house or to go to Bible study or to show up for choir rehearsal. So the only opportunity they're going to have to see and meet God is going to be you, me, at the car dealership, at the grocery store, at the laundromat, at the automotive repair shop, walking down the street. That's the only time they're going to have an opportunity to meet him. Do y'all get that? You are a world changer. You are a world changer. Because of the message you carry. And what makes the message you carry so powerful is the life that validates it. The change of life that validates it. And so look at this. For Paul shares and were more willing to acknowledge their true condition and seek Jesus' saving grace. For the Apostle Paul shares in Romans chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, his words, he says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is that all again. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I love the message Jesus gives the Pharisees. In verse 13a, Jesus sends them back to school. He says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6. 6 where God required loyal love and devotion over animal sacrifices. You see, God instituted the sacrificial system, but he did not want the rituals to become a substitute for inward righteousness. Somebody needs to say something. Amen. The animal sacrifices was to show that there was a cause for sin. Because of sin, the shedding of blood and death was required. It was the Pictionary of the experience. But you see... God is not a ritualist. Just because you ritually show up at church doesn't mean that God is pleased with you. 
Just because you ritually tithe and give an offering does not mean God is pleased with you because it's not about the ritual. And he is not pleased with rituals divorced from personal godliness. We're very good at the outward appearance of things. We know how to quote a few scriptures, sing a few songs, right? But that's all external. It's what's internal that makes the difference. And that's precisely what the Pharisees had done. It was all external. They observed the letter of the law, but had no compassion for those who needed spiritual help. They associated only with self-righteous people like themselves. So here's the thing. If you have to go into corners of social media to have your conversations about life with like-minded people, then you're not really sharing the true gospel. You see, you don't hide the gospel. The gospel doesn't hide in corners. Amen. It doesn't need a special platform. So I can, because normally when you do that, you're sharing your own ism and you're masking it with the faith. This was out in the open. Matthew was setting out in the open. He wasn't in the corner. It was in the open. I just want people to understand. We're very good at, at, at finding little niche platforms or here and here and here, and we find like-minded folks who will say and believe the same thing I say and believe, but it doesn't line up here. It doesn't line up in the word. So that's the issue. Because see, if you're truly a world changer, all the social media platforms out there and everybody that's claiming Christian, the world should not look the way it looks right now. You've got more visibility, more access than they ever had in biblical times. For the world to see you, the world to experience you, for the world to know the truth. But when you have to I'm going to move from this platform to this platform because I'm getting attacked over here and I like what they're saying over here better. But you're not where you should be here. I, 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 I get laughed at often because I've been saying I do classic Jesus. <laughs> and I said it yesterday to a young man. He, he giggled at me. I said, I do classic Jesus. And I broke it down to what I mean by classic Jesus. And I said, it's the one in the Bible, the, the one that, you know, didn't destroy anybody. The one that didn't hide his message with in, in his intentions in euphemisms or isms of any kind. He just said it what it was. You know, and um, here's the the takeaway from all of this. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because this is what. I've been struggling with the last few days that I've been working on this message is that he's been working on me on this, on the world changer and all this other good kind of stuff. But all the places he allowed me to go look and see, he showed me all the dark places in people's lives that claim faith, but they choose this platform because these people believe and think the way I think. And he showed me this. And they do the same thing over here. It's a different platform, just a different perspective that I really feel this way. And all of it is being masked or covered in Christianity. And that's the sad part. So when we come back to being a world changer, when we come back to being what God called us to be, this is the reason why we can't walk around and tell people to follow us. Because they see our social media. They see our lives. So an unsafe person will not follow you because they see hate. They see racism. They see placism. They see whatever. I just want you to understand. This is what he's teaching me. He's teaching me because see, it's out there. That's the reason why we can't say to somebody, follow me, that don't know the Lord. Because they see things that we put out there.
that does not, that scares them. Because if that's how your God is, I don't want no parts of that God. That's the truth. So you can't be a world changer if that is who you are. Just want to keep it real with you. Because this is where it gets even better. <laughs> Paul shares that there is no righteous people in the world. So Jesus Christ came to call men to repentance. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. But Jesus told, pointedly told them, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's who I came to call. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's desire for mercy as well as sacrifice. And here's the thing. We're getting ready to close. And Jesus' call is only effective for those who acknowledge themselves to be sinners. Y'all get that? It's only effective for those who acknowledge themselves to be sinners. He cannot dispense healing to those who are proud, who are self-righteous and unrepentant like the Pharisees. He doesn't kick in your heart, in your chest to make you accept him. But listen to what Jesus shares in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to give you a sneak peek. Here, he's sending in the world Changers. Listen to it. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Verse two, he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Verse three, go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. He's sending in the world changers. Now he started out with the 12. Now he's got 72. There is no names. Are y'all getting this? He sent them ahead of him everywhere he was going to go. Carry this message. Do y'all realize having the title Christian comes with work? And to be heard while we are investing in a life, we must earn the right to write on those hearts. Can you imagine sitting there at the table with Jesus, leaning back, dipping bread, and we're asking all the penetrating questions about who he is? Because they've got nothing to lose, but everything to gain. Can you, does God forgive every sin? Is he really a savior? Does he really redeem? Does he really forgive? Penetrating question because see, they've got nothing to lose. They didn't believe coming in the first place, right? But now you've got salvation in front of you and they can ask the questions that many of us would like to ask but are too afraid to. And he can say yes. Can he forgive any sin? Yes. And give you a new heart. Take out that heart of stone and put a heart of flesh in you. And put his word in you. In his spirit. Do y'all see the. Because see, he's earning the right to write on their hearts. You see, it's key that our witness before them is more than mere words, but is the essence of the life we live. Somebody needs to say something. Because see, I'm reminded of what James chapter 4, verse 17 shares. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So if you die today and you hadn't made it really right, but you played church, you can't get angry when he stand before him and he says, depart from me. He says, because you knew to do good and you did not do it. You chose your isms and tried to cover it in my name. Depart. Got to go. Because, see, we are called to be agents of change. Called. 
saved with a purpose to be agents of change. Many of us sitting in here this morning grew up in the church. Think of all the people that we have passed in our life to the point where we are right now. How many did you write on the truth of this word? How many did you really plant a seed? How many did you water? How many did you harvest? How many did you say, follow me? And they followed you. Think about that. You see, we don't get out of this without changing. The world doesn't get better without changing. So if you're looking for the Johns and the Pauls and the Peters and the Jameses and the Marks and the Matthews and the Lukes and the writer of Hebrews and all that kind of stuff, look in the mirror. You're now those and you have a name. Someone will say, I'm here today because Pete wrote on me. I should be gone. But I'm still standing here today because when I least expected it, God sent a peep by. You see what I'm saying? That's no different than when he said, I sent Timothy. Or I sent Paul. No different. I want to bring it home. I want to bring it home. I want you to understand that we read the word and we study the word and we listen to podcasts and all sorts of mess, right? But this has to be lived out in you. And everyone that you encounter should get it. Not forced, natural. It just comes, it oozes out. Pete and I used to talk about that it should be this way, the aroma of your life. That if you had just baked fresh chocolate chip cookies and I came to the front door of your home and you open the door, you don't have to tell me you are baking chocolate chip cookies. Why? Because the aroma is in the air. Amen. So shall your life be. The aroma of your life should be in the air. We're closing. We are called to be agents of change and our mission is to win souls for the Lord. Do you know it's not to get people to sign up to vote? Our mission is to win souls for the Lord. Because here's the last statement I'm going to give you and we're going to close this in prayer. If every lascivious Evil thing in the world was made legal. All of it. And we did our job as the church. Those laws doesn't impact the lives that become saved. We're depending on the law to do the opposite. To do the job that we won't do. We're depending on the law to do the job that we won't do. The law can't make you saved. It can't give you salvation. Our goal is literally this. To win souls for the Lord one life at a time. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word. Master, I pray that all that was shared here this morning was acceptable in thy sight, God. Thank you for these, your people that pressed their way, God. I thank you for the praise report for my brother John Grimes, God. Thanking you for his now home and his bride and so forth. She's sending me updates on how he's doing. So God, we praise you right now as he goes through this process of recovery. Pray, Lord, for a speedy recovery of his health and so forth. I thank you, God, for his bride. I pray that you pro provide strength and comfort and resources around her as well as she walks with him through this next phase of recovery. And God, just, just, 
thank you for being who you are. Also, my cousin Eric is home, uh, not home yet, but he's out of ICU and may get to come home this week. So um, God, you are a God who answers prayer. And I'm thankful to be able to say, Master, and to give the, the praise of that, how you are continuing to answer prayer and move. And so even now, Master, as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place, but never your sight, Father, I ask that you would go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace until we shall come together again. And we just give you praise. And in Jesus' mighty and holy name, we ask it all. The body of Christ says together, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Take care. Like and share. See you next week.